On my show, Monster of the Week, I dig up old creatures from different editions of Dungeons and Dragons, just 3rd edition, AD&D, 4th edition, whatever, and convert them so that they can be used in 5th edition. The entire point being that there are a lot of cool monsters out there that Wizards has created in the past that are not usable in the current version of the game that were left out of the monster manual. Something that happens sometimes when Wizards of the Coast releases an official product is some of those creatures that I've already done conversions of end up getting official conversions and find themselves on the pages of a brand new book. This happened I think in Vola's Guide to Monsters, there was like one creature and in one or two of the adventures that have come out so far there was one or two creatures here or there that I had already covered, like the Yellow Musk Creeper. But in Morden Canyon's Tome of Foes, I think there were like seven or eight different creatures that I had actually done conversions of just in the past year alone. This is always really interesting for me because sometimes these creatures are very close to the conversions that I've made and sometimes they're just way off base. So today we're going to take a look at all the monsters in Morden Canyon's Tome of Foes that were older monsters they ported over that I had also done conversions of and see just how they stack up. Hello and welcome to Dungeon Dad vs. the Dungeons & Dragons design team. I've been really looking forward to making this video and I'm super curious to see just how my conversions of these creatures stack up against the versions created by the actual D&D monster design team. I figured the best way to do this is to just go down the list alphabetically and we'll go over one monster at a time until we get to the very end. I'm basically just going to be comparing what their base stats are like, if they changed anything major about the monster, and if there are any changes they made that I also made or changes they didn't make that I did make and just kind of basically seeing which version I like better and just kind of taking a look at some of the new artwork and stuff compared to past versions of the artwork that were in older editions of the game. Anyways, without further ado, let's get into it and start things off with... So the Cadaver Collector was one of the older monsters from when I first started doing this channel that I didn't actually do a conversion of. For the first few months that I was doing Monster of the Week, I was still kind of refining my method of converting monsters, and I didn't have any actual conversions up. I would just talk about it and explain how you could use it in your game, and kind of leave it up to you to convert it yourself if you wanted to. Obviously that didn't last long, because I do put up conversions of all of the monsters I cover now, but the Cadaver Collector was one of those few that I have yet to go back and do a conversion for, and now it looks like I don't have to because Wizards of the Coast has taken care of that for me. I actually really like their version of the Cadaver Collector. It's kind of the same monster, it's got the same backstory of this wandering Warforged-like creature that just finds corpses on the battlefield and has become unable to distinguish between real corpses and those of people who are still living. So if you come across it, it's most likely malfunctioning and it's gonna try to kill you. One thing this creature has that I think is really cool is it basically combines the old cadaver collector with the soul spike. The soul spike was a creature from fourth edition that had this effect where any creature it killed would find its soul spiked on one of its body spikes, literally, and then it could summon that creature's spirit to fight for it. And the cadaver collector has a very similar mechanic, which is pretty cool. Um, one thing I will note about this creature is the new artwork is a lot more pastel, which kind of softens the brutality of what's actually happening here. The old artwork was super gruesome, and there was tons of like blood and bits of entrails and stuff going around. It was one of those creatures I would look at and think this would never get printed in a 5th edition book, just with the way things are now. So I was actually kind of surprised to see this creature show up, but I do feel their new artwork kind of softens things enough, but you still get the point. Anyways, where this wasn't a creature I actually did a conversion of, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it, just wanted to make a note that I did talk about it on the channel before. I think this is a great conversion, the CR might be a little bit high, but ultimately it's just a cool version of this monster. So the Eidolon construct in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes is not even close to the same creature that I converted from 4th edition. It literally shares its name and some of the theme, and that's about it. So the new version of the Eidolon is essentially a ghost, or I guess it's sort of a ghostly entity that's very difficult to kill, as many ghosts are, and what it does is this ghostly entity can inhabit the body of a statue that is meant to honor a specific god of whatever temple it's protecting, and that statue comes to life and can do powerful slam attacks and chuck rocks and all the good classic giant monster statue stuff. It does have a fear-based ability that can turn sentient creatures, which is kind of cool. It's honestly a pretty neat monster, but I'm confused as to why they decided to call it an Eidolon, because it's not even close to what the original Eidolon was. 
The original Eidolon is much larger, this creature's medium. The Eidolon that I converted is large, and it's also a construct, whereas this creature is an undead. And the original Eidolon was all about powering up its allies. Of course, it had the slam attacks and stuff if it needed to defend itself, but its main function was to go into a meditative stance that would buff all of its allies and cause them to do some extra damage. And if one of its allies was killed, it could like smite the creature that killed it. And if a creature attacked it while it was meditating, it could do some residual damage to that creature. It very much filled the role of like a battlefield commander type. Like it was this creature that a group of cultists or something would worship and then when it came time to do battle this creature would go into its stance and empower all of its followers which i thought was a really neat dynamic and now it's just kind of a statue that will punch people the lore is actually kind of similar the original eidolon was basically created by using some kind of magic to create a construct and it involved a ritual that required a spark of a divine being whatever you rule that to be as your dm and that would create an Eidolon. The new Eidolon is very much like a soul of a devout priest or something and the afterlife gets rewarded by its deity by becoming an Eidolon spirit that protects a temple that it once served in or whatever the case is. You can spin that a million different ways as a DM. It's difficult to compare these two monsters because they went in such a different direction with it. I'm not really sure how to even contrast these two things. If I had to pick, I would say I like my version better just because it is like a different type of creature that allows you to do all this weird battlefield commander type stuff. But that said, it doesn't even fill the same role, nor does it seek to. So their version of the monster that they put in Mordenkainen's Tomb of Foes is also cool. It just does a completely different thing than what the original creature that I ported from 4th edition does. I will say though, I thought the artwork for this creature was kind of cute. The statue that they chose to depict as being inhabited by an Eidolon is the same statue from the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Player's Handbook, the one where you can see the guy like gouging the ruby crystal eye out of the demonic statue's head. And in the new artwork, of course, that statue is missing an eye. I thought that was kind of cool. It's like a neat little nod to a piece of D&D history. And overall, I do like this creature. It's just weird that they called it an Eidolon. I'm not really sure why they did that. They could have just called it something different and named it as a new original creature. The Grey Render is a giant savage monster that claws people to pieces and of course has that very unique trait of forming a bond with a sentient creature and seeking to protect that creature. Right off the bat, the first thing I notice is their creature is CR 12, whereas mine was only CR 9, which is kind of hilarious because looking at the actual stats and damage numbers, mine is a much more lethal. The lore and background and stuff for this creature was kept almost exactly the same, which is cool because that's what makes the Grey Render actually interesting, is the fact that it makes this bond with the sentient creature and seeks to protect them and kind of acts like a big dumb guard dog, and it could just bond to a party member, bond to a herd of sheep, Cheap bond to the big bad villain and he uses it as a pet. You can use that for so many different things and it's just kind of interesting. My only real issue with their conversion is that it just kind of becomes a big dumb monster with claws. I mean it's not like it has to be able to do anything spectacular. The lore stuff that's there is really what makes this creature interesting like I said, but it might have some extra abilities that could make it kind of cool. Theirs just kind of has a bite in claws and that's it. The only real notable thing is that as a reaction it can claw someone, which is kind of cool I guess. The version that I made is a little bit more brutal so I can understand why they didn't go for something more complicated and brutal like my version was. I do feel the version that I created better maintains that sense of savagery that the Grey Render was all about when it was attacking someone. I had this whole thing where when it attacks, a creature has to make a save, and if they fail their save, they get pushed a certain number of feet away. So it's literally clawing at you and pushing you back and pushing you back every time it hits you and just relentlessly going after its target. And of course I added in that whole thing where if it grapples someone, it can like use that person as a weapon to swing against its enemies and potentially rend that person to shreds if they don't get out of the creature's mouth. I feel like my version was a lot more mechanically interesting, but it definitely wasn't as simple. I do appreciate the fact with the official conversion from Warden Canyon's Tomb of Foes that you can just grab it and use it and there's not really a whole lot you have to read through, which is ultimately a sign of good design, I think. Although aside from the flavor stuff, it doesn't really feel super unique. 
I do really like though the fact that they added in like a quirk table which was kind of neat so if this creature ends up bonding with someone and it's going to be in the game for a while it might have a quirk that it hates horses or is always trying to jump up and grab birds out of the air like just random stuff like that which I thought was really cool. And I do also like the art however I still think the version from 3.5 is still my favorite incarnation of this creature's artwork. Even the one from 4th edition I think is pretty cool but the one from 3.5 where it's just holding that giant tree like a club it just looks awesome. Next up we have the Marut or Marut however you want to pronounce that. This was another one of those creatures I didn't end up doing an actual on paper conversion for because it was from one of those videos where I was still figuring all that stuff out and I have kind of a lot of mixed feelings about this one because they changed some things that I think makes it a lot more in line with the 5th edition design philosophy but I also kind of miss some of those things from the older version of this creature. First off, it's CR25, which is wild. These things are no longer messing around. Marut, the older versions were quite powerful, but CR25, like this thing is going to annihilate most people. The way it always used to be was that the Marut was responsible for trying to stop people from becoming immortal. So liches or anyone who had really cheated death, the Marut would then be sent to uphold the inevitable law of death. Now they are upholders of any and all contracts that are signed within the Hall of Concordance. The Hall of Concordance is basically the main base on the plane of law where all the Modrons and stuff live. So any contract signed there is like a big deal and if you break your end of the contract, a Marut will come to make sure you either uphold it or destroy you if you can't. It does have some really neat mechanics. It's the only creature I know of that has an attack that never misses. It has an ability called Unerring Slam which is basically just a powerful slam attack, but it doesn't need to roll, it just hits you. It's very thematic, it's super useful for the creature itself, and it's just a cool ability. It can also teleport back to Sigil, the homeworld on the plane of law, where it can then force people to either go to prison there or uphold their end of the contract or however you want to rule that as a DM, which is kind of neat. They're basically godlike space lawyers at this point, which I'm totally on board with. I do kind of miss the old artwork, but I totally understand why they changed it. It seems like they're going for a more Modron themed creature to fit more in line with the other creatures we have in fifth edition from the plane of law. However, I just like the look of the old Marut, they were so badass, but at the same time, like, it's just a big grey guy in a helmet, so I can see why they wanted to go for something more unique and original. Still, super weirdly specific creature, and I kind of really like the direction that they went with this one. So, top-notch work there. 111 degrees? Phoenix can't really be that hot, can it? Oh my god, it's like standing on the sun! I don't even know where to begin with this creature. Their version of the Phoenix, I guess we'll start with statistics, is actually pretty comparable to mine. The version that I came up with is a lot more strength based, while theirs is a lot more dexterity based. They have the exact same CR of 16, the big difference is theirs seems to have a higher armor class where mine has a lower armor class but a lot more hit points. Ultimately that stuff isn't super consequential and it was kind of funny that I ended up on the exact same CR number that they did. Um, but this is where the similarities kind of end between these two creatures. So I guess talking about this creature we require a little bit of context. Something they wanted to do with this new book was create four like primordial massively powerful elementals. One for each of the elements. There's a very powerful water elemental, fire elemental, air elemental, and earth elemental, which we'll be talking about later. As a concept, I find that idea really exciting and pretty cool. The whole point was just that they were going to give us like a gargantuan version of a fire, earth, water, and air elemental that has a few extra abilities and is very powerful. That's pretty neat because the only elementals, like true elementals we have, are just the basic ones in the monster manual that are like CR5 or whatever. My problem with this is they chose to use the Phoenix as the fire elemental for this whole package they were putting together. It's basically just a giant dumb bird made of fire that is, and I quote, an elder elemental possessed by a need to burn everything to ash. What do you even mean? Why would that be what the Phoenix is? That's so extremely bland for a creature that should be absolutely legendary like a Phoenix. And honestly, this is probably my least favorite part of this entire book. I mean, we get creatures all the time that are just 
big bags of hit points that aren't overly exciting. I get that. Sometimes you just need a high CR monster that can output a decent amount of damage and is kind of thematic. I mean, that's literally what the core elementals are. So that's fine that these would just be bigger versions of them. But this is literally one of the most notable creatures from fantasy. And all it can really do is make a beak attack, a talon attack, and set things on fire. I mean, sure, it has a few legendary actions and stuff that just add to its survivability, but it doesn't do anything cool. It's just a big bird made of fire that flies around, pecks at people, and sets stuff on fire. That's the whole creature. The only thing that separates this from a giant fire elemental that can fly is a little bit of text explaining how when it dies, it explodes and leaves behind an egg that hatches into a new phoenix in 1d6 days. That's it. That's the only thematic thing from all of the phoenix lore and what's out there in the popular consciousness that they could draw from. That's what it all boils down to is that one line of text. I really, really, really dislike this creature as just a massive uncontrollable force of burning destruction. To me, the phoenix always more embodied a force of benevolence and healing and life and freedom and chaos. I feel like I really tried to reflect that in my conversion and whether or not that was successful, I guess I will leave up to you, but I felt that at least some of that came through. Of course the version I made also has a beacon talon attack because it is a bird, that's the very baseline of what this creature should be able to do, but I also gave it an ability where it can breathe radiant fire, it can restore its own hit point as legendary actions, and it can cast spells like regenerate, or raise dead, or true resurrection, you know, like a phoenix. The whole point of the phoenix is a cycle of death and rebirth, and none of that is really seen here. I also gave my creature a bunch of ribbon abilities that make it feel more like an epic encounter, more like a spirit of good that burns away evil and acts as a boon to the pure-hearted. I mean, I'm not gonna go literally through exactly what my conversion has, but I'll link it below with all the other ones, and you can take a look at it for yourself and tell me what you think. Maybe I'm off base here, but I always felt the phoenix was much more than just a big flaming idiot. Anyways, excuse me if I'm getting heated, but I just felt like this was an immense missed opportunity. And it's a shame because I actually really like this idea of four kind of primal elementals that are immensely powerful, but I feel like they just could have created something new that mechanically worked exactly the same way as their version of the Phoenix, but just called it something else. And then they could have created the Phoenix as its own entry and made it a monstrosity or some kind of fae or whatever they wanted to do with it, but just made it cool and interesting. Anyways, this is just going to devolve into a rant at this point if I keep going on about this, but the new Phoenix is a pretty low point in terms of monster design as far as I'm concerned, so... Moving on. Although one positive thing I do have to say about this creature is the artwork is dope. It does in fact look like a phoenix, which I feel like wasn't super hard to get right, but it's still a beautiful piece of artwork. So the Retriever is CR 14 compared to my CR 10, which is kind of in the same ballpark, but a little different. It serves essentially the same function, but the lore has been changed up a little bit. The whole deal with the Retriever is its master sends it out to retrieve a creature or an object or whatever, and it does so unerringly. It knows exactly where that person or object is, and it will go out, get it, and then come back or be destroyed doing so. There are a few differences behind the scenes. Mine is huge while theirs was only large. Their version also has a lot of immunities while mine does not. The one thing they did change was they made it into a construct instead of a demon. Both are kind of true though because the one thing they kept from the lore is that these creatures are created from the essence of a demon. Theirs is a lot more like the fourth edition version of the monster. In fact, that's what the artwork seems to be based off of. It's made out of metal and is a lot more robotic and construct-like, whereas the version I created, I went with more of the 3.5 style, which seems a lot more organic. In both cases, they're created. That's just a purely like aesthetic difference. Again, some small differences. Mine had eye rays of fire, cold, and lightning. Theirs has an eye ray of force and paralysis. And honestly, aside from the aesthetic differences between the two different versions of artwork, I actually like their conversion a lot more. 
It's very sleek, it's well put together, and honestly easier to read. Granted, this was one of my earlier conversions when it came to doing monsters in 5th edition, so I still had a lot to learn when I first made the Retriever. But given the option now, I would totally run the version in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes over the one that I created over a year ago. But that said, Retrievers of my world will absolutely continue to keep that organic appearance. I just find it a little bit more interesting, but depending on what adventure setting I'm playing in, who knows if that'll change. That's the great thing about D&D, is that you can tweak stuff like that with little to no recourse, so do what you want there. The Star Spawn Larva Mage is literally just the Larva Mage, but they retyped it into this Star Spawn group of creatures. Honestly, I'm fine with that because it doesn't really change much about the creature itself, and it just kind of recasts it in a role that's more aligned with what 5th edition is all about. It fits thematically with the other Star Spawn stuff, and if it's an excuse to bring this older creature into 5th edition, I think that's fine. It also does fit thematically because they still, even within the creature's description, make mention of Kies or Kies or however you pronounce that, the Elder Evil associated with worms, and that's kind of how these creatures gain their form. A lot of the lore there has remained pretty much the same. There's a CR 16, mine was 14, pretty much the same ballpark of CR once again there. And this one I was actually pretty shocked by how similar the conversions were. Mine had an ability that could paralyze its enemies with fear. Theirs has an ability where it can summon worms that restrain a creature, which are very mechanically similar effects that are achieved in almost the same way. They gave their creature innate spell casting, the ability to cast a few spells, which honestly I don't know how or why I didn't think of that at the time, it seems super obvious. And they both have a very similar slam attack, which is just their last resort if they're cornered and have to resort to melee. Instead of spells, I just gave my version of this creature ray attacks that weren't spells, but essentially served the same function. My conversion had a ray of cold that did a fair amount of damage, theirs can cast three rays of eldritch blast that do a similar amount of damage, so it's basically just do you want a ray divided up in three different rays or one powerful ray. The biggest change honestly between the two versions of the creature is that theirs has legendary actions, which is kind of a neat choice because it lets the creature cast some spells and stuff before the beginning of its its next turn, which is cool. And honestly, I feel like that's what warrants the CR2 bump that their creature has over mine. Overall, I think I actually like their conversion a little bit more than mine. However, I do feel they missed an opportunity to give some kind of fear effect because the version of the creature that I created has this ability where it can like take off its mask and reveal that it is in fact being made entirely out of worms, which is a fear effect that can terrify creatures and sicken them if they're nearby. And I feel like this creature definitely should have an ability that does something like that because it's a literal mage made out of friggin worms. That's disgusting, and it should be able to gross out both the players and their characters. And as far as the artwork goes, it's fantastic. There's been a ton of different iterations of this art. They all kind of look the same. It's just a guy in robes with a mask, and he's made of worms. Not a super complicated concept, and theirs does in fact look like a guy with a mask made of worms. And it's well drawn, it looks cool. I don't think I prefer it over older versions of the art. It just is what it is. It's another one of the same creature basically, and it looks great. That's all I really have to say about this one. The final creature on our list is actually one of those big giant four elementals as well. The Zeratan has been assigned the role of the big gargantuan earth elemental. This was another creature I did a video on but didn't actually do a conversion for. So I don't really have too much negative to say about this creature, but it is not really the same creature as the old school Zeratan was. Theirs is a lot more relatable. I guess it's gargantuan in size, so it's still huge, but it's basically just a massive turtle that can chomp on your players and spit out rocks and do some earth related stuff. It's well designed, it's a cool creature, it's got neat artwork, but I don't know why it's called a Zeratan because it's not a Zeratan, it's a giant earth turtle. And I realize that sounds like pretty much the same thing, but a Zeratan, in my mind anyways, should be colossal. Like it's literally an island that is on a turtle's back is kind of the whole point as is illustrated very clearly in the original artwork. And this was why I didn't even do a conversion of it because it is like a location. It's an interesting place that your players can go and interact with. And again, that's why I don't know why they made this the earth aligned creature because a Zeratan, again, wasn't really this kind of mindless creature that was out to just 
destroy and cause earthquakes and stuff. I always pictured the Zeratan as kind of like a wise ancient being that slept for centuries at a time and didn't even realize it had whole societies just thriving on its back. But I mean, this version of the Zeratan is fine. I guess it serves as a good starting point. If you ever saw this creature and you wanted to put like a Zeratan island type creature in your world, you could just use the stats for this, up its size to Colossal, and there you go. In my opinion, this creature basically just serves as a reference point for what could be a much cooler and more interesting idea. But again, that said, you could very well just use it as is written in the book as a giant powerful earth elemental and that's totally fine. I just want to make it very clear, I have nothing against this creature or the concept of these four elementals. I think that's really neat. I just don't know why it's called a Zeratan and why it wasn't like some other kind of rock worm or another just unrelated giant earth turtle thing. Calling it a Zeratan just seems weird because it's just not a Zeratan. But it's not like a Zeratan is a super famous thing from pop culture, so when compared to the Phoenix, I feel this one's much more forgivable and I'm not really upset about it. It doesn't matter. I'm probably not going to use it in my game unless I need a giant powerful earth elemental, in which case I will use it in my game and I'll just call it something else. I do also really like the artwork on this one, but I don't feel it gives a good sense of scale. Which is really weird to me because the old artwork from like AD&D that I was pulling from the original video that I did isn't that exciting. I mean, it's AD&D artwork, so it's good, but it looks very dated. But when you look at it, you get a good sense of scale of how big this creature is. This one still has like trees and stuff growing on its back, but it doesn't have that same grandiose, like that sense of like, oh, this could be a freaking island. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I think the artwork is good, but I feel like I would have liked a different perspective, I guess, on the same creature just because it doesn't feel as massive and overbearing as I think it is. But again, that's ultimately all just nitpicky stuff, so I'm not super upset about it. Um, this creature is cool. It's fine. So all in all, I think the official versions of a lot of these creatures are very cool. They're very interesting and very neat. I might be a little bit biased, but I think I prefer a lot of my conversions over some of the ones that made it into this book. However, that said, there are definitely still some big standouts like the Cadaver Collector and the Retriever and stuff like that. But even the ones where I say I prefer my version, like the Grey Render and stuff, I still think they're excellent conversions. I will say a couple of them leave a little bit to be desired, but that's honestly personal preference at this point. But the big question is, what do you think? I'm super curious to know what you guys think about these creatures. I've relinked the stat blocks for all the creatures I did do conversions of in the description below. So if you're not familiar with them already or you haven't gotten a chance to look at them, you can check those all out there. And yeah, let me know if you guys like the versions in the new books, if you preferred my versions, any comments you might have about the kind of clash that exists between some of them, like the Eidolon, where it's such a huge difference. It's okay if you like the Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes version better. I won't be offended. After all, my conversions won't improve without criticism, so that is what I rely on you guys for. Anyways, I do just want to say a big thank you to all you guys for watching this, and a big shout out to all of you folks over on Patreon. You have made my life a lot easier and continue to do so every day, so thank you so much for supporting the channel. And as always, if you're interested in following me on Twitter, joining us on Discord, all that good stuff, you can find underneath the conversions in the description below this video as well. So once again, thank you guys so much for watching. I do appreciate it and I will see you in the next video. Until then.